Hey everybody, Tim Albrecht here, and thank you for listening to the YFP Podcast, where each week we strive to inspire and encourage you on your path towards achieving financial freedom. This week, I welcome First Horizon Mortgage Loan Officer Tony Umholtz back onto the show. During the show, we discuss housing market updates and trends for the first quarter of 2024, including current rate supply and demand, and how the projected Fed rate cuts for 2024 are impacting the market. We also discuss the pros and cons of buying now versus waiting, and all things assumable rate mortgages, what they are, how they work, eligible loan types, and why they are growing in popularity. All right, let's hear from today's sponsor, First Horizon, and then we'll jump in my interview with Tony Umholtz. Does saving 20% for a down payment on a home feel like an uphill battle? It's no secret that pharmacists have a lot of competing financial priorities, including high student loan debt, meaning that saving 20% for a down payment on a home may take years. For several years now, we've been partnering with First Horizon, who offers a professional home loan option, aka a doctor or pharmacist loan, that requires a 3% down payment for a single family home or townhome for first time home buyers, has no PMI, and offers a 30 year fixed rate mortgage on home loans up to $766,550 in most areas. The pharmacist home loan is available in all states except Alaska and Hawaii and can be used to purchase condos as well. However, rates may be higher and a condo review has to be completed. To check out the requirements for First Horizons Pharmacist Home Loan and to start the pre-approval process, visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash home dash loan. Again, that's yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash home dash loan. Tony, welcome back to the show. Tim, it's good to be here with you. Well, we're excited to have you back. As always, look to you to get our most up-to-date information on kind of what we're seeing in the housing market, especially for those in 2024 that are looking to buy or sell. I know we've got a lot of first-time home buyers out there in our community that have been anxiously awaiting for the right, right time to buy. And we've got people that have been in their home for a while, maybe in a starter home that are, are looking to sell and, and to move to elsewhere. And just a great, crazy market that I think has hindered a lot of the movement out there, people buying and selling. So why don't we start there, Tony, of some of what you're seeing here early in the first quarter of 2024 as it relates to the housing market. You know, what's what's going on with, with interest rates? What are you seeing out there with supply and demand? Well, all, all good questions, Tim. And as always, great to be here with you. I, um, you know, it's been an interesting year. We haven't been into 2024 very long, but a lot has happened. And, you, you know, it, it, we kind of forecasted that this year would be a little better than 2023 as far as, you know, mortgage volume mm -hmm. and, and purchase volume. But we knew it was going to be a tough year. We're still coming out of this, this higher inflationary environment. There's been some headwinds. But um, overall, there is a lot of good things we're seeing. And then there's some not so good things. So I'll start with one of the positives. One of the positives are, and again, these are, you know, inventory levels on average are higher in most markets. So every market's different. We've talked about that in the past. Some markets are, you know, you can't generalize across the country, but on average, inventory levels are better in most areas. And typically around this time of year, you build a little bit more inventory, but mm -hmm. in a lot of places, we haven't had this, this amount of inventory since the you know 2019 or right before the pandemic, which it's, is nice for buyers, right? Because you, you're finally getting an ability to find some, some product and to negotiate a little bit. Um, that being said, we're still not in a normal market. We're still under a normal market. Most markets are in that four month range of inventory and an average market is probably five to seven months, right? Of inventory. So we're still in a fairly tight environment for housing and we're still a bit underbuilt nationally, meaning that we don't have enough housing units. So that's also, you know, one of the reasons housing prices haven't fallen, you know, despite the higher rates and the headwinds in the economy. Um, regarding rates, we have seen rates rise since the beginning mm -hmm. of the year. I mean, rates were high, higher in October, early November than they are now, but we've seen an increase. In, and a lot of that is due to positive, positive economic data. Mm -hmm. um, economic data has been positive on the, the, you know, on the spending front. Employment has been good. Inflation is still there. I will say this that the last inflation report had, had inflation, but it was counting some inflation from last year. So like if you, look past that, we're really going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I think the, I think rates are going to go down as time goes on. I think it's going to be very slow this year, 
But, you know, post the election, I think things could be pretty good. So, I mean, that's a roughly a year away, but I think you're going to see rates really get better um, as time goes on. But, but the other issue too, coming back to just, with, you know, supply and demand, we have as a, as a mortgage company, we have so many clients we've pre-approved that are looking. Yeah. It's just going to be, and I'm just one of many, but you, you know that it's just going to get more competitive as those rates drop. So it's like a kind of like a double-edged sword, I think, you know? So Yeah. And I know we well, see that Tony in our, our community, you know, a lot of first time home buyers, that's, it's natural, right? As a new graduate, you finish pharmacy school, you're, you're looking at that home purchase. A lot of people are getting antsy on the renting front. Hey, I've been renting right. for a while. Not, not as long as I wanted. They're looking at what they're paying for rent. Hey, I'd love to own a home. would love to build some equity long-term. And so certainly some pent up demand. I know we see in our community uh, and, and I think that's natural and, and expect to hear it broader than that too. And I want our listeners to kind of hold that thought on, hey, if if interest rates do come down, you know, here in 2024, what is the impact that that might have on the availability of the market? Because we're going to talk in a little bit about, you know, this concept of buy now versus wait, and what are some of the pros and cons. But before we do that, Tony, you shared something with me before we hit record that that I thought was of interest, would be of interest to our listeners about what you're seeing out there related to the age of a roof and how that might impact being able to get an insurance policy, which of course, you know, for, for a home buyer is a really important piece. So tell, tell us more about what you're seeing there. Sure. I mean, in, in the insurance aspect, it's really big. And I think certain states are going to be tougher than others. So you're, you've got, um, I, I'm based in Florida, so we're ground zero for this, right? Because we've had, we had some legislation here in Florida that made, uh, there were some abuses in the, you know, really more against the insurance industry by, mm -hmm. you know, various you know, groups and so forth. Um, and, and people have really just taking advantage of, the, of, of some of the flexibility and it caused some, some challenges here. And there's been some changes as, as always, insurance companies are going to change what they insure. One's been roof age, right? So mm -hmm. roof age is a big deal down here. Um, it's also in other States too. This is not something that's just here. Um, and, you know, the costs of insurance have gone up a lot, right? And, and, and especially in more hurricane prone areas or fire prone areas in the West, you've seen costs of insurance go up. And I, um, I've seen like newer properties, you know, while they're more expensive, the cost of insurance is much lower, you know, mm -hmm. on newer construction, but it is more expensive generally to buy new construction. I would say the, um, the age of the roof can vary a lot by and type of roof, whether it's shingle or tile. So a tile roof typically has a longer age of life than a shingle roof. And the, um, you know, they'll sometimes will cover those longer, but, but some insurance companies won't touch it under 10 years. If it's, if it's under, wow. it's gotta be under 10 years, some are 15 years. Some will go longer with what's called a four point inspection, which not only looks at the roof, but looks at your, you know, your electrical, yeah. Uh, as well, it looks at your plumbing. It looks at other aspects of the home. Um, but those are some things you you may need to do, and it can become harder to to get insurance or get the insurance that makes sense for you as far as costs go and coverage go. Uh, but it's definitely an issue right now. And then you know, with repairing a roof, it's um, a, a lot of times it has to be done prior to closing. It's not something mm -hmm. you can essentially escrow for. Right. You know. Right. So. Uh, you know, if you're selling a home and you have an older roof, repairing the roof is going to help you get a much better deal on the house mm -hmm. for sure, as far as the seller goes. I'm glad you said that. that's exactly where my mind was going, right? If people are thinking about selling a home, this has an impact. If people are thinking about buying a home, it has an impact. And obviously every area of the country is, you know, different in terms of the the risk and the exposure yeah. here. But it, it's just another good reminder when you talk about rising insurance costs that, you know, especially for that first time home buyer, it's very easy to fixate on purchase price of the home right? Purchase price of the home. And we want to be thinking about the whole financial picture. So yes, it's the purchase price of the home. It's the mortgage that we're going to carry with the principal and interest, but it's also the taxes. It's also the insurance. It's also the upkeep, you know, and all those things involved. So here we're talking about an older roof and being able to get an insurance policy, or if you do those insurance costs potentially going up on top of that would be obviously the potential replacement cost to be thinking about of the roof as well. Um, That's so right. I have, I have one little trick and secret. This is something but we've, we've done for 20 plus years and it doesn't have a bearing on anything with mortgage, but sometimes clients will say, Hey, I need to get this insurance down. And you, you know, you have to have, an, you have to have a certain amount of coverage to yep. get a mortgage. Right. So, but one thing you don't need 
is I'll see these policies come in with six hundred thousand dollars worth of personal property coverage. Yeah. Well, as a lender, we don't care about personal property. Now, I, I recommend if you've got valuables, you have some coverage, right? But a lot of folks, especially buying their first home, don't have six hundred thousand dollars worth of artwork and other you know collectibles to insure. So. A lot of times taking that down will give you some premium savings. And we've done that quite often over the, over the years too. You know, we suggested that. Good, good reminder, right? To kind of look at line item of your insurance policy and what you do or don't need, especially as you're looking at a few options. Tony, as an aside, but related to that, I, I we had a, a unfortunate fire in our neighborhood of a home um, just down the street. And ever since then, we're now a year and several months out where there's been no movement on the house. And wow. I- I presume it's related to something being tied up in, in insurance. I don't know the full backstory, but ever since then, I have looked differently at my replacement cost yeah. line item, as well as the relocation piece of, you know, when you think about how long might this go on and what are the right. expenses associated for relocation? So good reminder to, to look and understand your homeowner's insurance policy. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Tony, I want to get your opinion on buy now versus wait. Obviously, we're we're talking broadly. This, of course, is specific to one situation. But what made me think about this is I had a conversation with a colleague a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this individual is about seven years into their career, dual income household, young family, just had their second child, bought their first starter home about three years ago, and they're now itching to move, right? Family has grown. Uh, they want to get a better location, a little bit closer to commute to work. But naturally, as a part of that, they're facing some headwinds. Those headwinds are obviously the market that we're in. Interest rates are higher. Home costs have appreciated, of course. And in this case, they're moving to a area that the homes are just more expensive altogether. And so when I was asking some questions, you know, what I heard and what made me think that this would probably resonate with a lot of our community is that there's several barriers that they're facing. Yes, the current market conditions, but also hey, we've got these student loan payments that are still hanging around, right? We've got daycare costs, which are rising you know, quickly, especially now that they have a second child. And they really feel like they need to be saving more aggressively for retirement. They feel like they're behind on retirement. And, and I think this is a great example of someone that I talk to on a regular basis that's in this new practitioner phase of their career that fe feels like they're not on track with their other financial goals, and is feeling somewhat trapped by this home situation that they're in. And, you know, if we were to consider a move, potentially, knowing what's going on in the market, knowing where interest rates are at, you know, potentially do we buy now when, when rates are not at the highest, as you mentioned, but, but they're quite high and hope we can refinance in the future? Or do we wait and see what happens with interest rates come down with, at that point, running the risk that, Hey, as rates come down, I think it's safe to assume we're going to have a lot more, you know, sellers and we're going to have a lot more buyers that flood the market. So just would love to hear your thoughts, you know, knowing that this is a common situation we, we probably would hear and see in our community. Sure. I mean, it's a great question and it's very common across the country right now. Um, we're seeing it with some of our clients, you know, growing families, outgrowing their home or have, have to relocate because of a employment situation. Mm -hmm. Very common. So I, I would say, I mean, if we take a step back, we kind of touched on it at the beginning of our of our discussion here is if you look at the overall market, we've got we've got lower than average inventory in most areas mm -hmm. still, even though inventory is building, which inventory building is a good thing because we need it going into the spring season. But the you're likely going to see pretty stable housing prices, right? Probably escalating. Like even if you look year over year, prices went up over last year. I mean, certain pockets fell. There's certain areas that, you know, fell, I think, but, but on average home prices actually went up last year, even with all those headwinds. Right. So I think you're getting into a pretty stable investment as well. You know, if you, if you're moving up, like in the, in the situation with the, the colleagues you spoke to, I mean, moving to a better part of town, um, a bigger home, I mean, all these things could be meaning more appreciation on the house too. So yes, the cost is more, but there is the upside of appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we are going to all see like anyone that bought in the last year, year to year and a half, almost two years now, they're going to get opportunities to refinance in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you exactly when, but we've, we've even seen some that are popping up that made sense. Now, after these last few weeks of rates rising, we had a few clients and some of them had to pay their loan for six months just because that's a guideline for the type of program they were in and we couldn't refinance them, but they 
the rates had dropped over a point. They could have refinanced already. There's people that have already refinanced. So I think I think you're going to see opportunities for that as time goes on, where your cost of ownership will actually come down. But it, it is tough right now. It's very tough. Um, there are less buyers buying, so I think you're going to be able to negotiate better with sellers, which yeah. is the is the benefit. But um, it's 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 a tough decision. I mean, this is where you look at the whole financial plan. Yeah. Right. You you've got to look at okay, I've got daycare costs rising. I, I want to save more for retirement. You know, that brings me to like, you know, making sure you're utilizing all your company matches, yeah. right? And all the things you can do if that other bucket's going up for housing, you know, and, um, I, and, and there is no question housing prices have trended higher and, you know, they may, it, what would be healthy and, and really I'll take a step back here. I mean, what we saw in 21, 22, 20 as well, that was unhealthy. It was great to see your house price go way up and you make made money on equity, but it was unsustainable. Right. Having 2023 was a blessing. Yeah. I mean, let's look at it that way. I mean, that was unsustainable. And yeah. this was a blessing for all of us because it would have created a bubble in my yeah. mind. And we stopped it. And and the Fed, you know, Fed helped to stop that. And I think that was a win. It made it made my business a lot harder. I know a lot of people, but it was one of those things where it was it was a blessing for for this industry, I think, and in, in the housing market in general. So, um, you know, just just again to clarify, I think you you you're going to see a fairly flat market. I feel like this year, I do think you're going to see a lot of people stepping in. I will also uh, mention that builders are opportunistic, and mm. the builders know there's an opportunity right now because we're underbuilt. We didn't yep. build enough homes from 2010 to 2020. So they're going to be building. We'll get to equilibrium eventually in the next few years. And I think things will be a little different then. But I don't think prices are going to collapse in most markets, you know. And I think there's been a bit of a pullback in certain areas. But for the bread and butter communities where most people are owner-occupied, you're not going to see a lot of variance, you know. Great perspective, Tony. And I I think what really resonated with me with this conversation that I had is, you know, yes, there's the objective math part, right. Of buying a home and and we want to make sure that it fits in with the rest of the financial plan. But it, it also, there's an emotional part of this that is important, you know, for, I, I know firsthand for us, our home is we spend most of our time in our home. Right. It's, it's right. a place where we're making memories and experiences. And so there's this tug and pull that I see with a lot of pharmacists, which is a healthy kind of balance that we've got to strike of, Hey, how do we have a reasonable percentage of our income going towards our home so that we can achieve other financial goals, right? We don't want to be house poor, but also we recognize that, you know, part of living a rich life today is potentially the home and what we're going to be able to build in that community and our experiences and so forth. And th- this is the the tug and pull, right? That we've got to think about. I do have one question and I'm hesitating to even ask this because I have a feeling the answer is it depends. But when you mentioned the the example of a 1% reduction and, and refinance and you know, in that example, they hadn't yet got to that six month timeline that you mentioned with that loan product. Is there a general rule of thumb that you think about in terms of rate differential and where someone starts to begin to think that a refinance, of course, when you consider costs involved in doing that may be advantageous. Is it at that point? Is it less, is it a little bit more, or is it just too, too much of it? It depends. Well, I, I don't want to say it depends because I, I don't. Want to, <laughs> but there's a lot of variables, and one one of them is clearly is the loan size, right? Yeah. You know yeah. how much balance is. I mean, in my 21 plus years doing this in this business, I mean, I've generally said one percent, but I've had numerous, especially when we do what's called premium pricing, which means we as a lender pay the closing costs, which is a way to do that. Now you don't get the same rate that you would if you paid the the customary mm-hmm. costs, right? But like I've had larger loans where we've done it at as little as 50 basis points, which is a half point. But if you have a million dollar loan and there's no closing costs and you're saving Bigger five thousand yeah. a year in interest, you're going to do it. So we've we've had all kinds of scenarios, but generally I look for one percent. And okay. the intent, depending on the, on the loan size and the state, certain states have higher closing costs than other states. You know, so Makes that sense. would be the two variables. Yeah, reason I ask, I think to your point is we're going to see this come up and maybe we'll have to do another episode later this year if, if we start right. to see things trending because we haven't talked about it right much in the last couple of years for good reason. Um, I but be surprised as we get into the third quarter, get closer yeah. to the election, we start seeing some movement. Yeah. So just we'll watch it, you know. 
The next area I wanted to pick your brain on was uh, around assumable rate mortgages. So I read an article in Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago that really just piqued my interest about this topic. I know one we haven't talked about on the show before, and obviously in the current rate environment that we're in, I have a feeling some of this information starts to go viral and people are like, well, wait a minute, can, can I get an assumable rate mortgage? So can you define for us what is an assumable rate mortgage? You know, How do these types of products work? And then give us the you know, the, the real life of how viable these may or may not be as, as people are considering their options. Sure. Well, th they do exist. It, it wasn't just an article in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they do exist. They've been, they've been out there for a long time. And um, there's really only three programs that are, that are available for assumability that are assumable. And one is called an FHA loan, which we've touched on. The other one's a VA loan. And the last one's a USDA loan. Okay. So they're all three government programs. And the interesting thing about VA is you don't necessarily have to be a veteran. You can assume it. You still have to be approved by the servicing lender, um, but you don't have to be a veteran, which is interesting. Mm, you don't I have know to that. Be, okay. Which is interesting. So, um, you know, a couple of the, the pros and cons. Obviously, the big pro is, first of all, you have to find a seller willing to do this, right? That's number one thing. The other thing would be, I had someone call me on one of these, just asking my opinion. And it was, it was, there was the ability to assume the loan. It was a low fixed rate. It was around three and a quarter or something like that, much lower than today's environment. But the amount of appreciation above mm -hmm. what that loan is, and you have to pay the bot, the seller for all their principal reduction, but the home is worth so much more oh, now. Oh yeah. The down payment is huge. So like, and this, I'm just kind of giving an example they may have borrowed 300,000, but the house is worth 420. Yep. So you're going to have to bring 420,000 to get to what they owe. Or sorry, 120,000. It makes sense. Yep. The, you know, so it's a hundred, it's a big down payment. So, so with, with these assumable loans, a lot of times the, the, the new buyer has to come and compensate Got the it. owner for the difference. And it's a huge amount, right? Normally, because the markets run up so much yep. and they may have put money down. Now, those three programs do, I mean, FHA does carry PMI, but the rates are so low that it wouldn't matter in a lot of these cases. The VA loan, you have to get approved by the servicing lender, okay? So they will have to approve you for the product. That means you're going to have to meet all the criteria for the loan size, just like any other loan. It's not going to be the same as communicating like with a team like myself or another lender yeah. that is originating every day. You're not going to get that service level. It's going to be more like a, we'll get to it when we get to it type of call. And, but the, the, it is possible. It's just not easy, mm -hmm. you know, and not only do you have to find the, 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 the proper owner and home, you know, the home you like with the owner that's willing to, to let go of the loan, you'd also have to compensate them and have to have some cash for a down yeah. payment. So there's a, there's, those are the very, that's why I don't think when I read the article too, and I saw it. There was a guy starting a startup tech business to to to. to it's just going to be really hard yeah. because at the end of the day, you gotta you gotta make it all work and meet all these guidelines and 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 just I just think it's going to be a detriment just the amount of money folks will have to bring to get that rate, you know. And that's a piece, Tony. To be honest, I I didn't think a whole lot about right that what you're highlighting the example of the you know three hundred thousand dollar home that's now worth four twenty and they're bringing one hundred twenty thousand dollars of cash. Like you then have to factor into all this. What's the opportunity cost? Right. Of bringing right. a bunch of cash, not 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 even of hey, do you have it? But what's the opportunity cost That's of right. that one hundred twenty thousand dollars of cash, and not just focus on the the rate comparison? Great stuff, great stuff. Well, let's wrap up by talking about the pharmacist home loan product uh, that we've collaborated and sharing with our community, Tony. Now for several years, available through First Horizon. You know, I think more than ever, this is an area that we see of interest among pharmacists. Even though there's you know maybe less that are out there in the market right now that are buying. Obviously, we're going to have more coming in the future. But as we've seen appreciation, as we've seen the, the home values grow over time, obviously that down payment for a new practitioner, especially that first time home buyer can be a huge barrier. And, you know, one of the questions that comes up is, Hey, how can I potentially buy a home, get into a home without having to put down a conventional 20% down as I'm trying to focus on student loans, daycare costs, investing all the other goals that we talk about. And so I think that's why we were so excited about this collaboration several years ago, continue to be excited about the collaboration is what this product can do for, for pharmacists in that position. So tell us a little bit more about the pharmacist home loan product, who it's for, 
uh, minimum credit scores, maximum loan amounts, how the PMI, all of that works. Sure, sure. Well, you know, the minimum credit score, we'll start with that, is 700. You have to have a 700 credit score. And um, and if you're a little below that, my team, we have ways to help give ideas and actually help with uh, even giving like a, a scenario to, mm. to run. We've done that for quite a few folks to show them what they can get their credit scores to by consolidating debt or paying down a credit card, whatever it might be. Um, the max loan amount right now is, in most counties is 766550 but there are areas of the country where we'll go higher based upon that, that the, you know, the, the county's maximum loan amount. So okay. especially like in California, uh, in and around like Northern Virginia, there's certain areas where we can actually lend a higher loan amount because the loan sizes are, are higher, eight, eight, even to 900,000. Um, and there is no PMI, which is the big, big driver. I mean, that's like a car payment for most people when they buy a home. So, we can save that with this program. Um, there is no prepayment penalty, which is big too. We need you know you need that that reassurance that you right. can refinance if rates drop. Um, the um, you know with the uh, uh, the reserves and so forth, there really isn't a big need for that. There's even the ability for the seller to give some concessions, mm -hmm. which we have to watch that as things go on. But that's something that you know if you want to get some of your closing costs covered. To, to keep more cash back, um, that's something else it'll allow too. And that's bigger now, you know, Tim, where I see when, when a home needs a little bit of cosmetic repair, just that extra five, 6,000 that the seller's willing to, to pay or compensate, that can be the, the ticket to getting that work done. Yeah. Right? So, so those are the things that, that, that it'll allow. So there's a few extra little pieces there, but 700 is a minimum credit score. We do look at debt to income ratios around 43%, not to get too in the weeds, but mm -hmm. you know, income to debt ratio. Um, it does take a lower factor for student loans than like a traditional Fannie Mae loan would, would do or, or FHA. Um, so there's a little more flexibility, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty much a, you know, quick summary of the program. And and you, you may have said it and I didn't I didn't hear it, but remind us of the percent down required and first time oh, home buyer versus yeah. second. Good catch, Tim. Yeah. So first time home buyer is three percent down, uh, no PMI. If you've owned before, it's five percent down. Got it. Okay. Okay. That's the difference. Awesome. And we have all of this more information on our website. If you go to your financial pharmacist.com forward slash home dash loan, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. You can get more information on the pharmacist home loan product and offering. We also have a form that you can fill out quickly there that will get you connected to Tony and his team to learn more as you're looking at options. Whether you're in the, hey, I'm ready to buy now, or I'm thinking about buying in six months, make sure to check out those resources and fill out that form so we can get you connected to Tony and his team. Tony, this has been great as always. Really appreciate your perspective. The other thing I just want to say to our communities, if you have a question, you know, whether you're buying, selling, thinking about buying and selling 2024, you have a question that you'd like us to tackle. We're going to be bringing Tony back on the show here in a couple of months. Just send us an email, info at yourfinancialpharmacist.com. In the subject line, just put home buying, home selling question, and we'll make sure to tee that up for Tony on a future episode. So Tony, thanks so much for taking time to come on. Hey, thanks for having me, Tim. Great seeing you. You too. Take care. Before we wrap up today's show, I want to again thank this week's sponsor of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, First Horizon. We're glad to have found a solution for pharmacists that are unable to save 20% for a down payment on a home. A lot of pharmacists and the YFP community have taken advantage of First Horizon's pharmacist home loan, which requires a 3% down payment for a single family home or townhome for first time home buyers and has no PMI on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. To learn more about the requirements for First Horizons Pharmacist Home Loan and to get started with the pre-approval process, you can visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash home dash loan. Again, that's yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash home dash loan. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. 
Furthermore, the information contained in our archive newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.